Now on BBC One, with some strong language, Charlotte Callan looks at a new police scheme designed to keep young drug dealers out of prison in Beyond the Front Line. We're just like scavengers, basically. Do you know what I mean? We should just walk around and rob people. It's as simple as that. And hurt them? Yeah, if they don't give us the money, we used to hurt them. Yes. Grove in the road, the front line. There was a time that the police couldn't even drive down there good. And we'd be mad dogging them as well, like, what are you gonna do? Do you know what I'm trying to say? So I think that put us number one on the police's hit list. Do you know what I mean? Because they was like, who do these little fuckers think they are? Clinton Wilson, known as King Aggie, was the leader of one of Britain's most notorious gangs of drug dealers, the Aggie Crew, a group of friends from East Bristol who grew up to become violent and dangerous criminals. The police couldn't grab me off of this road here. I would stand right here with my back to them like this. Yeah, they ain't grabbing me, because if they grab me, all of them's running in. So we're a problem. Simple as that. Because you were such a tight group. Because we were such a tight group. The Aggie crew ruled Bristol's crack cocaine market with intimidation and violence. But when Clinton Wilson's criminal empire crashed around him, he lost most of his adult life to prison. But 20 years on and Bristol is still the crack capital of England. Now Clinton wants to stop other young people getting involved in drug dealing, ending up in prison or worse. You have to understand these kids nowadays, they're running around with swords, you know. But I know that they don't know that if they stab you, you're going to die. Our main story tonight, cracking down on knife crime. New figures show that 100 people have been fatally stabbed so far this year in the UK. Greater Manchester Police says that it is increasing efforts to tackle knife crime. Detectives have launched a murder investigation after an 18-year-old man was stabbed in Birmingham last night. Police officers from West and South Yorkshire have held talks with the Home Secretary to discuss the problem of knife crime. Tonight, we start with the scourge of knife crime sweeping England. Drug dealers don't just flood our streets with crack and heroin. They're also carrying knives to assert their control. But is prison always the answer? The police in Bristol have another idea. They've named it the call-in. It is risky, but they hope it may save lives and keep some young people out of prison. What I do see is an awful waste of talent and bright young individuals that have turned to criminality. What can we do to stop them offending? And that's what the principles of the call-in is all about. The young people have been given access to education, apprenticeships, even driving lessons, with the hope that they'll get a job and a legal means of making money. The police also hope that it will cut violent crime on our streets. But will it work, or will these young people, who've often had a very difficult upbringing, be lured back to their bad ways? expecting a few more leaders on the pitch today. We've lost our last three games because we haven't had... All we can hear is Clint. Come on. Stay dumb. We're doing all right at the moment. Yeah, we're fifth. But I ain't good enough, boys. We're better than that. Flick! These days, the only shooting Clinton Wilson's involved in comes on the football pitch. Yes! There you go. But in the 1990s, he was the leader of the Aggie Crew, one of the most feared gangs in the country. It started the same as probably most of the gangs in the, in the ghettos. Just me and two, two of my friends, you know what I mean? And we was just going around doing badness on the streets, doing, getting up to boys, mischief really and truly. Lots of robberies, just trying to make money. We was the tightest gang that Bristol's ever seen, definitely. Like we loved each other, and it that, that was the main thing in it. Like, so everybody knew that they were safe, as in nobody couldn't trouble us without repercussions. The relationship between the police and the community in St Paul's was difficult. Attempts to enforce the law had resulted in the infamous uprising of 1980, and more violence six years later, during a raid on the Black and White Cafe the hub of drug dealing on the front line. 
Distrust of the authorities was passed through generations, and as the 80s became the 90s, many young people in St Paul's still felt they lacked opportunities. Why didn't you just go and get a job? You were 16. Go and um, get a proper job, like everyone else. When I was 15, 16, I was offered jobs. I, was a, I used to cut hair and I was wicked at barbering, but all I was being offered as a young un was YTS. I was making more money than YTS when I was 13, 14. YTS was £25 a week at the time. Yeah, so in my eyes, I ain't doing no YTS for two years. £25 a week. Work every day in a ghetto youth's mind, that's like wasting time. Because you can't live on £25 a week. And more to the point, you're worth more than £25 a week. So the way the Aggie crew decided to get money was to take it from other people, even if that meant using violence, something Clinton now regrets. We, we was prepared to do anything to anybody. Do you know what I mean? Every day when they were going out to do things, it was about how much money we could get and bring back. That was it. But it became clear that there were more lucrative money-making opportunities in St Paul's than street robbery. I bought a 16th for crack which is, was a hundred pound then. Yeah, I made 10 stones out of that 16th. I got a phone call and it was a mate. He said, yeah, there's a, some girl at the bottom of the road. She wants one of those things, innit? Do you know what I mean? So I just left the bed sits, walked up the road, come back 20 quid. You have to think like before this, we might be out all day for 20 pound. Do you know what I mean? There's been days where we've robbed four or five people and got a fiver between 10 of us. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So we're just out there just robbing people because we ain't got no money. The Aggie crew were already well known to the authorities for their robberies, but they soon became the main players in Bristol's Class A drug market. And when the occasional £20 sale of a rock of crack had developed into a multi-million pound business, there was no bigger target for the police. Bristol saw the effects of the crack and heroin epidemic land within its city. So as a result, there was a fairly significant drug market, which resulted in violence on the streets. And that was from a range of murder to violence and a significant amount of assaults. Gary Haskins, who runs the call-in for Avon and Somerset Police, was an officer in East Bristol when the gang was at its peak. And the drug war on his patch saw guns being carried by both sides. To comment on the level of violence that the Aggie crew and other gangs pose, we resulted in armed police being deployed in, in the city. And that was the first time a British force had done that, or an English force? I believe it was, yeah. We had guns, I'm not going to lie that. We had guns, you know what I mean? But we'd only take the gun out if we are going to shoot somebody, so... So you shot people? People have been shot, yeah. By you? I never shot nobody, no. All of this area would just be full up of people. I mean, mainly outside the air, outside the cuff. Oh, because this, which one was the cafe then? This, this one, yeah. Black and white cafe? Yeah. The police hoped that getting the Aggie crew off the front line would give them the opportunity to stop the scourge of crack cocaine that was blighting the area. But Clinton thinks differently. If I leave this line today, there ain't no less drugs being sold out here. I'm just not selling them. Trust me, there ain't no taking me and drugs off no road. <laughs> no, 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 no. All they're doing is stopping my money. They're not stopping no drugs. The, the um, users are not gonna go, oh, he's locked up and let's not smoke drugs no more. No, they don't. They come down here the same way. They don't, they don't have to see me, they're seeing another guy. That's it. They didn't take no drugs off the road by locking me up. Trust me, at all. The highly organised Aggie crew, well known on the streets of St Paul's, were based here in Stapleton Road. In the summer of 1998, they dealt widely in heroin and crack cocaine, valued at more than a million pounds. The crew's boss, Clinton Wilson, masterminded deals through a fleet of cars and runners with mobile phones. And today, six of them were jailed for a total of 38 years. What you did here yeah. meant you went to prison for what, 10 years? Yeah. More? Yeah, more, more than that, because I've done two of them. You know what I mean? How much did that change your life? Dramatically. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because 
that's a long time. The first time I went was seven years. The second time I went was five years. So it's 12 years of your life. Obviously, anybody loses 12 years is gonna change them. Do you know what I mean? But I just grew up anyway, to be honest, you know what I mean? I wouldn't say prison rehabilitated me and taught me new skills and taught me how to think differently or nothing like that. I'd done that all myself. Prison didn't teach me nothing. Just wasting my time. For many gang members, trying to break free is near impossible. Clinton spent many years in prison. Some of his friends are still inside and will be for the rest of their lives. But one former member of the Aggie crew paid the ultimate price. Jammer Powell, known as Ruffus, was murdered in December 2017. And I reported on it. He was targeted in a swift and brutal attack. Police were able to piece together what happened that night thanks to CCTV cameras both inside and outside the club. Too many young men losing their lives. There are too many families that have to go through what we've had to experience. Clinton lost a friend that day. Layla Powell lost her brother and Solomon Powell lost his son. No fucking age, we are nothing. No, no, no. We are dealing with love and the hopes. So if you don't want the love, oh, stop for real. I'm going to my beautiful son. It's this. Jamal was stabbed. Do you think his death might actually be a warning to some people? I think that probably made a couple of people put their knife in their pocket the next day. Obviously, roughs, you know what, you know that what that done to me, and I mean that devastated me, man. We still are friends. All these like 26 years now, something like that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Lots of people can't say that they're friends with somebody 25 years ago and they're still friends, you know what I'm trying to say? The whole lot of us as well. Do you worry that you might be next, that you might be a target? Yeah, of course. But I'm not going to stop walking on the street or stop coming out of the house or, do you know what I'm trying to say? This is what you live with. These are the things you've got to live with. Nothing will bring that young man back. I met with the parents, I saw the absolute distress that they had gone through. What words could I say as a police officer that would make things right? You can always say, we'll do our best. Whatever words I said would never be enough. And the community, I think the community have stood back and, and realised that enough is enough. And, and you know, thankfully now the communities of East Bristol are pulling together. And they've always been a very tight community. Um, but I think the death of Jammer really resonated across that area. They realised that, you know, that was one too many knife crime murders. I'm just crying off for peace right now, you know, in Bristol among the youths them. I've got a son, he's seven. You know, you have to think about the younger ones, their future, what's going to happen. It's really sad. We don't want this to happen in like in a free, regular basis with, you know, see people come mourning in life of, because of knife crime. It is so sad. Knife crime isn't going away. In June this year, a man was stabbed to death in broad daylight, in the middle of St Paul's. A teenage boy has been charged with murder, which makes a project like the Calling even more relevant, but even more risky. The Calling goes further than any other English police force. It's a six month diversion scheme that allows young drug dealers the option, go to court and face prison, or take this opportunity to break out of the cycle of crime. They're given immediate access to Bristol City Council's post-16 youth services, which provide both education and training. They're also assigned a mentor and have weekly fitness sessions here at Empire Fighting Chance. <laughs> Thank you.
and it's an idea that Clinton supports. He spent a lot of time in prison and doesn't want to go back, so he says he's put his criminal lifestyle behind him. He wants young people being promised a life of easy money for selling crack or heroin to think again. If somebody would have come to me and said, look, you don't have to go to jail now. I know you've done that, it's a mistake, do you know what I mean? Um, but we can um, maybe do something, if you do certain things, you can get around that. Avon and Somerset Police's call-in scheme is based on a project in America and is one of a kind in England. One of the mentoring programmes used on the call-in is Street to Boardroom. And on the course today are young people who face different challenges in their lives, not necessarily related to drug dealing. It's run by Clayton Planter, a St Paul's boy who took a different path in life to Clinton. I remember looking when I was younger, looking at the Aggie crew, was Clinton, who's obviously the leader of that group. And I realised these guys were doing things the wrong way, but he had leadership. There was something about him and they able to do what he did at a young age. I realised that people in the corporate industry were doing exactly the same things, but doing it the right way. When you look at somebody from the street, um, like Clinton, he's, he has the product, the drugs. He has his crew. The corporate has his team. He's the boss man. The corporate has the manager. Um, they make money, lose money. Corporate people profit and loss. Street people go to prison. Or you've got the corporate industry what turns bankrupt and lose their job. What I've realised is that if you have the right mentor and you have the right belief that you can achieve anything. But you need to surround yourself with those people. These, these kids are not too far gone. They're not. They're talking about positive things, you know what I'm trying to say, and, and um, future. They're chatting about their future, so, which they probably don't really do very, very often, to be honest. Do you know what I mean? The future's like a week to most of these young ones, you know what I mean? So for them to even be speaking about, yeah, let me set up a business in three years' time, we can be here or be there, do you know what I mean? Brilliant. Like, even if they don't manage to get f their business plan fully done, just the fact that they're thinking about this today, and do you know what I mean? We're all brainstorming together and coming up with good ideas. It's like a rotating door, isn't it? There's no point sending them into prison and you've got the, they haven't got no skills to come back out and survive out here anyway, so, like myself, do you know what I mean? You end up just going back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, till in the end, out here becomes probably a lot harder to live in than inside. So what would success look like for the call-in? One man who's turned his life around is Roger Moore, who went through the Street to Boardroom programme a couple of years ago. Roger had a long immigration struggle and didn't have the right to work in the UK, so ended up selling drugs just to make some money. Getting involved in that is risk, and for some people it's life and death. And I, I, I thought at the time I didn't have a choice, so, you know. Because you couldn't get a normal job? I couldn't. I couldn't get a normal job, so I couldn't depend on my mum. I'm, I'm a big man. What do I do? It's not something I wanted to do or glorify or sort of was proud of, but I didn't know another way to make a living. So unfortunately, I had to get involved in that for a while until, you know, things changed. It was only when the situation escalated that Roger realised he needed to get out of that way of life. Someone pulled a gun on me and that sort of put things in perspective for me and I sort of dropped it immediately after that situation. It was easy for me to let it go because I knew, I saw what that lifestyle leads to, either prison or grave, and I didn't want either of those things. So after that situation happened to me, it really put things in perspective that this isn't the lifestyle that I want. After attending a street to boardroom course and receiving guidance and support from Clayton and his expert mentors, Roger has achieved his dream of opening his own Caribbean restaurant in Bristol. I think it needs to be as easy to get involved in business and learn trade and learn entrepreneurship as it is easy to pick up a knife, as easy it is to get involved in drugs or any, any criminal activity. 
there needs to be doors that are opened for people of my background. When you look at Roger Moore, he's come from the course, he's an ambassador for Street to Bodrum now. It, it, it's believable. He's not talking about it, you can actually see it. He's a CEO of his own restaurant. Gary Haskins wants to see Roger's success story replicated by other young people facing similar challenges. Giving those that have committed a crime an opportunity to see the misjudgment that they've made. Giving them the tools within their toolkit, i.e. giving them a mentor, giving them some guidance, putting them in um, key mandatory courses like with Clayton and people like that so that they can see the error of their ways and perhaps understand that crime isn't always the way. Give them an opportunity how to apply for a job, how to seek further education. You know, we're giving them basic life skills that perhaps weren't available at the time. Young kids all across the country are getting involved in drug dealing and gangs. Some of them are even carrying knives. Tonight I've come to an inner city Bristol youth project called ACE to meet a young boy called Zach. He's only 14, but he's already been in trouble with the police. We changed his name and his voice to protect his identity. How did you get involved in drug dealing in the first place? I know people who take drugs, and I know, like, it's just easy. I know how, like, where to get from, from that like, weed to like heroin. Crack, cocaine, pills. I just wanted to make a quick change, yeah, just quick money. Why was it so easy? Because, like, coming from the place I come from, it's like, it's just one of those things you just, you're supposed to know, that like you're expected to know. When you say coming from a place like you've come from, talk to me about your life. Places where there's like poverty, you know, drug addicts, you know, single mothers, like everything. What kind of things have you been through in your life? You're only 14. I've, ex like, I've experienced like family members being killed, my dad being in jail, family members being in jail, being poor. What kind of things have gone on in your family? You talked about your cousin who was shot. What happened and, and how did that make you feel? Uh, like some people came in this house and they shot him. And it was, like, it was sad when I heard about it. But then after I was like, I just got on with it. It was like, it's just normal. What kind of things have you been offered to sell drugs? Hundreds. Thousands of pounds. Zach says he doesn't carry a knife, but he knows people that do. And he says the reasons they do are not what the media would have us believe. They're, just, they're making, they're making like, young people look like they just carry knives because they're like, they just want to hurt people or something. Or like they're troubled in the head or crazy. But it's not really like that, to be honest, no. So why are young people carrying knives in a way that they weren't before? I don't know. For protection, I don't know. I can't speak on the past generation, but I don't know now, it's just for protection. How easy do you think it will be to get away from the drugs and the money and the danger and say, I can be a 14-year-old and I can live a safer life? All I know is just being in the streets. I don't know. Like, I couldn't see myself working a normal nine to five, like ever in my life. But I could see myself doing stuff that's wrong, which is obviously like kind of messed up, but. When you meet Zach, you realise just how young these kids are. I mean, he's 14 and at school, and yet he talks about knives and guns and murders as if they're all just completely normal. 
It makes you wonder what he'll be like when he's, say, 16, 18, and whether projects like the call-in are simply too late for him. You know, for so many different reasons, people make the wrong decision in life and they get a criminal conviction. So what we've done within Bristol East is try and think of a number of diversion schemes that will stop people trying to make that wrong decision that will either end up in their injury or end up in a criminal conviction or could ultimately end up in somebody's death. The, the knife carrying issue is one that's not going away. And we still continue to have one too many young people injured from violence or knife related criminality working with the community, working with the great team I had at Bristol East. We looked at how we can stop this happening and give people options in society. What would you say to the people that you hurt? Because they want a sorry from you. I'm, I would say I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Definitely very, very sorry for the people that I hurt, like when I was, people that I've robbed even. Do you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't their fault. You know what I mean? How important is it that people like Clinton are involved in trying to help other young people? My personal opinion is hugely important because for somebody like Clinton to come forward and say crime hasn't paid for him, is that not a lesson for everybody that takes that journey? I would love to try and change some stuff around Bristol just to help the youth them and give them some insight into this thing, the real thing. I'm the real thing. Help them from being in these gangs, yeah, fighting about nothing and going to prison. I just believe that enough of these kids are doing this thing because they're scared. Street to boardroom, we, we broke that down real quick. You know what I mean? That's what it's about. It's just a mentality, nothing else. You know what I mean? That's what we're trying to change. If we could change mentalities, you change, you change so all heap of things in this whole area. Some people will question whether these young people should be given a second chance. They've committed the crime, so they should do the time. But the police say one mistake shouldn't define the rest of their lives. We know that one person on the call-in has already been kicked off for re-offending. It's now down to the others to take this opportunity and break free from a life of crime. Could this be a real answer to the problems we've got with knife crime, with gangs, with young people? I think it would make a difference, Charlotte, but I'm invested into it, so I'm naturally biased towards it. Ultimately, for me, the risk is, do we allow that young person to go back into prison, commit further criminality and have less opportunities, or do we invest into that young person to stop them committing crime going forward? Prisons don't pay. Don't get me wrong, I've met people in prison where I think he needs to be in prison. Yeah, they shouldn't let him out. Like, there are people in the world like this, you know. Believe me, do you know what I mean? But the majority of people you meet, they've just gone down the wrong path and they just don't know what to do. But if we get one success, then it's worth investing into. For me, to take that young one person that could be a victim, could be a perpetrator, but to give that young person an opportunity surely is a successful story. If I could help one guy, just one of them, yeah, then have I not done something good.